one. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to our business continuity under the HIPAA security rule. My name is Carlos Leyba. I'm the CEO of Three Lions, the publisher of the HIPAA Survival Guide. I'm also an attorney and managing partner with the Digital Business Law Group. Today's agenda is as follows. We're going to cover the learning objectives, define what business continuity is, and then discuss the components of business continuity under the HIPAA security rule, a data backup plan, which is a required implementation specification, disaster recovery plan, which is also required, emergency mode operations plan, again, required, testing and revision of business continuity, addressable implementation specification, and application data criticality analysis, also an addressable implementation specification. Now we're going to, um, just a little housekeeping, we're going to take questions as we go. So uh, Martin Gwynn, our Director of Marketing, is uh, again moderating. He'll be He'll be looking at the uh, chat session for questions. If you have questions, um, enter them in the chat, and then at the end we'll do some additional Q&A. So here are the learning objectives. We want to provide a foundational understanding of the business continuity requirements under the HIPAA security rule, and really this is one aspect of HIPAA that really, for obvious reasons, we're talking about EPHI, focuses on the HIPAA security rule. Uh, again, the definition of business continuity, the components, and why it matters. Um, one of the reasons that it matters, obviously, is that if you don't have a uh, business continuity requirements met, you're, uh, you could be in for a willful neglect fine if something bad happens, like you have a breach and there's an audit or a lawsuit, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and finally, we want to provide organizational stakeholders with a sense of how your business continuity continuity initiative should be implemented and we're going to give some sample plans and how uh, again in, in our, our tradition of trying to give news you can use how you can quickly get started to put something at least something together that is uh, defensible as far as a plan goes. So here's the three-legged stool, the privacy rule, the security rule, and breach notification rule. The emphasis here is is on the security rule. And here's uh, the standard. From a regulatory perspective, this is part of the uh, administrative safeguards in 164.308. And for those of you that are new, if you see a URL, when you get the slides, you can actually click through to get to that section uh, in the HIPAA Survival Guide and get the full text of that session. That uh, section. So it's on its uh, standard seven under the administrative safeguards. Contingency plan. Establish and implement as needed policies and procedures for responding to an emergency or other occurrence, fire, vandalism, system failure, etc., natural disaster that damages systems that contain EPHI. So the focus here is on, EP, on EPHI, not on uh, paper charts, etc. And here are the components that we talked about. These are the implementation specifications. You can see that three are required and two are addressable. And we're going to, uh, just for review, again, define what is required and what is addressable. And we're also going to talk about the, the security rules, general principle and flexibility principle, or general rule and flexibility principles that in this case actually may provide some value to smaller or mid-size covered entities and or business associates. So that was sort of the, the regulatory definition on, under the HIPAA security rule. From a business perspective, uh, we, we can use a more general sort of description of what business continuity means. So business continuity encompasses a loosely defined set of planning. And you'll see as we go through this webinar that it really is a loosely defined set of planning. These components uh, tend to overlap. Uh, and so, you know, that's a little bit confusing. It's not like there's a bright line where one component starts and the other component ends. Uh, loosely defined set of planning, preparatory and related activities, which are intended to ensure that an organizational's critical business functions, and that's important to know, critical business functions, not all business functions, but your critical bus business functions will either continue to operate 
despite ser despite serious incidents or disasters that might be otherwise have that might otherwise have interrupted them or will be recovered to an operational state within a reasonably short period of time, right? So those are the two things. Continue to operate, and if you can't continue to operate, recover within a reasonably short period of time. And part of that definition is resilience. One, critical business functions and the supporting infrastructure are designed and engineered in such a way that, that, that they are materially unaffected by most disruptions. Okay, like if you have a redundant power supply uh, that you could fail over to really quick, you would be materially unaffected by uh, a power outage. If you have a redundant internet connection that you can get to almost right away, you would be materially unaffected by um, an outage to your primary internet connection. Recovery. Arrangements are made to recover or restore critical and less critical business functions that fail for some reason. Obviously, you recover your critical business functions first, and in the case of a covered entity or, or a business associate, it's going to be those functions that restore EPHI so that, you can, so that you can use the EPHI for your business. You can provide EPHI uh, to the benefit of your patients, et cetera, et cetera. And then the other systems could be recovered in a secondary fashion, like for example, if you do experience uh, a disaster, then you know your EHR system is probably more critical than your billing system. For example, as important as billing is, what you're trying to do is get operational again and have a contingency. The organization has to establish a generalized capability and readiness. And this is what you're going to have to show. This is the visible, demonstrable evidence that you're going to have to show HHS or a court of law that you have a capability and readiness to cope effectively with whatever major incidents and disasters occur, including those that were not and perhaps could not have been foreseen. So contingency preparations constitute a last resort response. You're going to want to show at a minimum that you got some kind of plan in place and at a minimum that that plan has been tested, at least to the degree of tabletop testing. And we'll talk about what tabletop testing means. Uh, so that you can make a good faith argument that you've met your business continuity requirements. And so really, there, like any other requirements under HIPAA, you need the policies, the organizational processes, and the ability to track process results in order to show visible, demonstrable evidence. Uh, that you're meeting your business continuity requirements. So your business continuity program must allow you to produce and track BDE, that you have a viable plan in place because that's the only way you're going to um, uh, verify to HHS or a court of law that indeed you've met the requirement, right? You have to show evidence, and in this case, mostly, um, most of the evidence is going to be in the form of plans and and the um, testing of those plans to the, to the degree that you've done it with any rigor, both creating the plan, going through the plan, training your folks on the plan, and then testing the plan. That's the evidence that you'll need to show. So according to the security rules, general rule, a required implementation specification is one that all covered entities and BAs must implement. Absolutely no exception. I think by now that, that should be clear. An addressable implementation specification must be implemented, or a substitute must be implemented, or a compelling reason must be documented as to why your organization elected not to implement anything at all. I'm going to tell you just as a, a rule of thumb that generally that's not a good idea. You have to, you have to it better be a compelling reason a damn good reason why you elected to do nothing at all under an addressable implementation specification. So addressable is not something that you can just willy-nilly ignore. Uh, and probably um, HHS or the uh, legislators could have uh, could have used a, a better term, but that's that's the term that we have and what we have to live with. I'm going to take a pause here and just ask Martin: Are there any questions? Uh, this not, general stuff. not at this time. I'm just going to alert you to the fact that uh, 
uh, go to webinars running a little slow, so give it some time between slides or start your new slide earlier. Okay. Okay. Under the security rules, general rule. I'm doing this from memory, but I, I believe it's 164.306 is the general rule. There's something called the flexibility approach, okay? And it states as follows, covered entities and business associates may use any security that allow the covered entity or business associate to reasonably and appropriately, appropriately and these are the weasel words that are used throughout the security rule, reasonably and appropriately implement the standards and implementation specifications as specified in this subpart. In deciding which security to use, um, that's a little odd phraseology, but that's this is word for word what, this, what the regulation says. So in deciding which security to use, a covered entity or business associate must take into account the following factors. Notice it says must. The size, complexity, and capabilities of the covered entity or business associate. Are you a large hospital chain or are you a small ambulatory practice? The covered entities are the business associates' technical infrastructure, hardware, and software security capabilities. The cost of the security measures you're required to implement and the probability and criticality of potential risk to electronic protected health information. So although, although you have some flexibility, and it appears that, it, it, well, it doesn't appear. This is, this is the principle that HHS included in the security rule that it thought would allow the security rule to scale, which means that would allow the security rule to apply to a small ambulatory practice as well as a large hospital. Okay? By and large, um, this is a promise that really has not been fulfilled and can't really be fulfilled because we just talked about that you better have a damn good reason for not doing or implementing an addressable implementation specification. But this is business continuity, I believe, is one of the areas where the flexibility principle really does come into play and really can help a uh, small business associate or covered entity deal with um, what is an in incredibly non-trivial wicked problem, which is business continuity, including disaster recovery as part of that. So we'll talk more about how the flexibility principle applies uh, to business continuity. So, you know, historically my argument has been, yes, there's this flexibility principle, but you know what? Eh, it doesn't really provide that much flexibility. Sorry. Uh, but we'll we'll, uh, we'll illustrate uh, how that doesn't apply here. So a data a data backup plan is one of the components. Okay. Now, if you don't already have a data backup plan in place, then you're really walking a high wire without a net. I mean, clearly you just can't run a business that has EPHI without a backup plan. The risk here is far more than not meeting a HIPAA compliance requirement. Rather, it's a real threat to the viability of your business. So. I mean, this is IT 101. I, I can almost assure you that if you don't have a data backup plan in place for your EPHI systems, you're going to be found to be in willful neglect if something bad really happens, right? This is just, you got to have it. So for the sake of this webinar, let's assume that you do, in fact, have some sort of data backup plan in place. The real questions are, what are its attributes? What, is, what does it consist of? And how do you know that it's working? Okay, and that's the real... Um, challenge with respect to data backup plans is that it, it you know at times vendors would like to make uh, customers and prospect, prospects think that it's it's a, a set and forget, uh, but nothing could be further from the truth. You you need to uh, read your data backup logs every day. You need to test whether or not you can recover from your laws, you need to check the media, lots of things can go wrong with your backups, uh, in, in which case you, you may have thought you could recover and you come to realize that you can't recover at all because the backup has been failing for the last month. 
So an organization is required, right? We already talked about this. This is a required implementation specification to back up information system data on a regular basis. Policy should specify the minimum frequency and scope of backup. So, for example, daily or weekly, incremental, incremental or full, based on information system criticality and the frequency that new information is introduced. Even if you have a data backup plan operational and you haven't documented it, you, you, you haven't met the requirement. You have to take the rigor to, to somebody else if, if you know, depending on who's responsible for backups. Now, but unfortunately, for a lot of small uh, and even larger organizations often, you have one key person or two key people that are, that are responsible, and, you know, if they should get hit by a, a Mack truck, probably uh, the entire IT organization would be frozen with respect to how backups actually work because they have backups that are operational, but they've never bothered to document them. Okay, and that is even worse as you scale down to smaller clinics or practices. You probably have Joe, the IT guy, down the street, and he set up your backups, you know, five years ago, and you've just been that dumb and happy thinking that it, they're working. And if they're, you know, Joe goes on vacation or gets hit by a Mack truck, you know, God forbid, trying to figure out, uh, you know, the kind of disaster, the recovery will be the disaster. So. Okay, so I, systems backup policy should designate the location of the stored data, file naming conventions, media, rotation frequency, and method for transporting data off-site, which nowadays might, might include uh, just over the internet connection using the cloud. Okay, the specific method chosen for conducting backup should be based on information system availability and, integr and integrity requirements. These methods may include electronic mirroring, vaulting, network storage, and tape library systems. And I'm going to try, as we go through this exercise here and, and talk about each of the components, um, give you some real world examples of what um, a relatively small boutique law firm does in this space to try to meet its requirements that it doesn't lose client information. So. Here's a relatively straightforward data backup plan for a small to medium sized practice. Okay, and you can take this as a starting point for your own plan. And if you don't have one, then I absolutely would, because you could at a minimum claim that now you got something. Form incremental backups daily. Okay? So incremental backups mean what what has changed from yesterday? What new files were created, right? That's the incremental backup backup. Perform full backups once a week or once a month. Now, personally, we do it once a month, okay? Now, the difference is whether you're doing it weekly or monthly is that if you take a full backup once a month and daily backups once every day and for some reason you have some catastrophe on day 29, Right? What you're going to have to do is restore the entire month's backup from the previous month and then apply each incremental backup, daily backup that you've done, 29 of those, to get back to the status quo. If you've done weekly full backups, then you only have to apply last week's full backup and then incremental for five or six days or whatever. So that's the difference. Uh, time it takes to do uh, the backups and time the recovery. You're going to want to have verification on for all backups. This is a feature that's part of your backup software. It means not only back it up, but after you back it up, do a, a hash or a checksum or do something to make sure that what was copied exactly matches the source. Verify that, that this file got backed up correctly. Now this is a step that almost no one does, but I encourage you to do it because you don't know and you can't make a good faith argument that you've actually tested it if you don't attempt to restore files from your backup. So periodically you should attempt to restore files from your backup to ensure that they're functioning properly. That's really the only way that you can verify. You have to review backup logs, we talked about this, on a daily basis for errors and warnings. So 
part of what's hard here is this is really not a set and forget exercise. This is something that you have to have that you have to do with a fair amount of diligence. You just have to do it every day. Right? You have to check those backups, perform those backups, and verify that they're working. Somebody's got to be looking at that every day. Now, you should have one set of off-site media should always be kept off-site. Right? That's that should be obvious because if you have all your backup media uh, where your practice is and you have a fire that burns everything down, you just lost everything. Right now, if you have um, if you had your backup media off site and you were taking it off site, in our case, once a month, then it would still be pretty bad. You would lose, depending on what day you had this catastrophe, you might lose a month if you had a fire that wiped everything out. Okay, I mean that is kind of a worst case scenario because you could, you could, you could take uh, pretty simple precautions like putting your backup media in a fireproof safe, the ones that you have on site, put in a fireproof safe, and hopefully if there was a fire, that would protect it. But you know, of course, Katrina could strike, and if you get flooded, and your safe could go you know, uh, into the ocean, who knows. Um, you should always have a redundant set of on-site backups for quick recovery. In other words, your off-site backup really is for a catastrophic disaster, but you should have a full set of backups on-site so that if, if you need to recover quickly, you can. And finally, consider using the cloud for off-site backup, full and incremental. And I'm going to pause here. Just Martin, are there any questions uh, about this? Um, yes, uh, we're going back to tabletop for for a minute. What is the suggested frequency for conduct conducting tabletop or other disaster recovery recovery exercises? And what is an example of tracking or logging these exercises other than showing meeting attendant lists and an agenda? I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't. I didn't get that last part. Other than showing what, like a, a meeting attendant attendee list and an agenda. Okay, so the, you know, just best practices. I think the recommendation would be at least, you know, your entire disaster recovery plan or business continuity plan, right? Which is not just a data backup plan. Which is this just component one should be tested either live, right? Which, I don't recommend for smaller practices because it's so expensive to do a live uh, test, okay? But it, at a minimum, a tabletop test. And what what you could do is uh, no, you could do more than just uh, you know just some uh, perfunctory. We had these people attend. You actually uh, the uh, if you're going to tabletop test, you're actually better walk through the scenario, create a scenario. Hey, this is what happened. Katrina struck. What do we do? Who's in charge? Who's got this role and responsibility? Oh, did they train their backup? Do they have their, you know, and, 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 you know, you could have your staff there and you can call on your staff. What would you do first? What would you do second? How do we know who's in command? How are we going to communicate? It's, you have to go through that with some amount of rigor, right? And probably you could include certain live tests, like if you if you're not testing restores, Right, I would say during your tabletop, okay, yeah, you're not going to test the whole disaster recovery plan, but at a minimum, go test and see if you can recover and see if your backup plan, which really the foundation, is has enough rigor. So, um, you know, this is this shouldn't be viewed if you take the the tabletop approach, um, or if you take the complete live approach. I mean, this should be viewed as a strategic important uh, exercise that you're going to do with some rigor or otherwise really it's not worth doing and and if you're just going to have a meeting and sing kumbaya uh, well you can do that but it's probably not going to help you avoid uh, a fine it's probably not going to help you in the court of law right so you can fool yourself but you're not going to be able to fool um, either people that are interested stakeholders that are looking at what you did or you know, uh, God forbid, a really disaster strikes, and then you don't have a, you, you 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 don't know how to react, right? Because you just you just went through some exercise to satisfy a compliance requirement. 
Anything else along those lines? Yes. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. I'm back. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, yes, the second part of that question is restoring production data back in into a test or a de de development environment sufficient versus actually restoring to production systems when testing re recovery procedures. Yeah, remember that this is, there's no perfect disaster recovery plan or business continuity plan. It's it's, it's what is reasonable and appropriate for your organization. I, I you know I, I believe you know restoring production tapes to a backup system would be reasonable and appropriate, right? You can't, I, I mean, you, you, you know, I mean, most covered entities for sure can't afford to take their live systems down, you know? I mean, and so what do you do? Then you, you, you try to do the next best thing. So, yeah, I would, I would think, I would argue that that's a reasonable and appropriate approach. Um, what is considered an off-site geographical site? Well, you know, and that's going to be a site that um, where the probability of a single disaster doesn't take down both sites. Okay, so if you were uh, in, in New Orleans and Katrina's uh, bearing down on you, right? You would want your off-site uh, backup to be, you know, in some cave in Utah or something where you know Katrina's never going to get to. Right or not, not at least you know the probabilities are so low that that's probably as good as it, it gets. You know, you don't you're not going to want your offsite disaster recovery backup to be in Gulfport, Mississippi, because Katrina will took both of those cities out. Right, so that that's what's meant by that. Um, have a company pick up and return tapes. That's not cost effective. Was was the comment and. Uh, I have a tendency to them they're probably in the same location or a close location, as you pointed out, so it's all gone anyway. Well, there's different levels of protection, right? If you're taking, if you're cycling media and, you know, frankly, the, the uh, we're going to talk about this in a little bit when we talk about hot, warm sites, hot, hot sites, having a company take tapes off-site or other media, at least um, those companies usually, uh, you know, have vaults, they, they're halon protected, they're protected against fire, they're probably somewhat protected against a, a hurricane, you know, they're probably not on the ground floor. I mean, they've probably taken some measures to survive a, a, a catastrophe, right? Like otherwise, you know, you pick the wrong local vendor. They've taken some measures to do that. It's just that, you know, the preferable more safe route would be to have that maybe for local and you know do an internet backup somewhere in Utah for example right now like I said perfect here's the thing like all compliance efforts perfection is not what's required reasonable and appropriate is what's required and you can probably make an argument if you were a small uh, ambulatory practice right that doing having a rigorous plan and taking media off-site and maybe backing up to the internet that was a pretty good, and you know, that was a pretty good plan, right? And hopefully, you backed up to the internet, and the internet wasn't in the same city, right? So, anything else? No, that's all we have for the moment. Okay, let me move on. So, this isn't rocket science, but I got to tell you, backup and recovery and business continuity is what IT people and compliance people probably hate the most. Right, it really is non-trivial. It's hard to do. You just have to have discipline to follow your process. Right, it's not it's not ever going to be a fun thing to do. But your business depends on having the current patient data always available, and a data backup plan really is IT 101. If you mess this up, you really messed up the foundation of your entire business continuity plan and your entire disaster recovery plan. This is something that you need to have in place apart from any regulatory requirements, right? You just, today, you know, we're always on 24-7, 365. We live in an electronic world. This is something that you just need to be doing, regardless if, if HIPAA existed or not. So we're moving on to the second component, which is, again, required. This is all under the business continuity standard of the administrative safeguards. That was standard number seven that we introduced at the uh, outset. 
An organization is required to create a disaster recovery plan. A DRP usually applies to physical disruptions of service that deny access to an organization's primary facility and infrastructure for an extended period of time. Right? So, uh, and this is where some of these components begin to overlap and, and bleed into each other. What is, you know, what's, what's an extended period of time? Well, you know, if you lost power uh, and you had a backup power supply and it kicked in and it ran for a half a day and then it failed and you had no prospects of getting power for another two or three days or two days, that's, that's probably enough right there to trigger a disaster recovery, right? That, that you're just not going to get back up in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, Excuse me. The DRP focuses on information systems and is designed to restore operability of information systems and the facility and infrastructure to house them at an alternate site. So where you look at a uh, data backup plan, you're really focused on just getting this particular um, site back up and running, right? We had, we had a, server, uh, a server's hard disk crashed. We got to restore from backup. The focus on getting that server back up. And, and quickly, but uh, it, it's really not a case where your infrastructure, uh, the locality, et cetera, et cetera, has been disrupted or destroyed. Okay, so a, 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 a disaster recovery plan is triggered when you have a, a larger uh, event, and it tends to focus on making sure that there's an alternate site available. So when you're talking DRP, not backups, but a disaster recovery plan, you're really talking about something that's going to Katrina-proof your environment. Restore the environment in a reasonable amount of time at a selected alternate site. And that's a practical matter. We talked about this. The alternate site must be geographically located so that a single disaster can't take out both locations. It's wider in scope than a data backup plan for obvious reasons that we talked about. So let's review. Uh, uh, a straightforward DRP for a small to medium sized practice. You're going to have to select at a minimum, right? This is this is just like 101. This is a CYA. Did you even address the requirements? Right? Did you first of all? Did you understand the requirement? Right? I mean, you can't you can't provide uh, re, you know visible demonstrable evidence that you're in compliance if you don't if you're not literate enough to understand what the requirement says. Uh, and then what did you do? What did you do in response to that? So you're going to have or have to have a DRP, you're going to have to have a cold, warm, or hot alternate site based on the criticality of your systems, the flexibility, the size of your organization, et cetera. Right? So we're going to go through these definitions just so that you're aware of them. A cold site generally means that your organization will need to reconstruct from backups your information, your information systems and likewise other physical infrastructure. Like you're going to have to have a server that you can get your hands uh, on quickly, so that in this on this alternate site you got this server and then you start with your tapes and hopefully you can get something back up. But a cold site usually means little more than you have some place to go. You you know that when Katrina strikes, where you're going to go, right? And you hope that you can recover in a reasonable amount of time, and you know that you're going to have to. Uh, uh, not only restore tanks, but probably create some infrastructure. Ensure that you have access to these servers that uh, that were that are part of your contract with this vendor, etc. Right. So you're now you're relying on third parties that provide these kind of services. Now, a warm site generally means that some infrastructure is already in place at the alternate site. Maybe you already have a server up and running. Maybe that server is even. Uh, um, you know, getting restored with production data, at least, you know, it's a week behind or something so that it's not, um, it, 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 it's a less of an impact to get up and running because you already have some infrastructure there. The, the, the production data is being restored on that server, but so you would have to restore the last week instead of, you know, a full month or whatever. So, but, and then a hot site means that you can flip a switch and you would be up and running. And obviously, you know, you would want to have a hot site. Now, given the evolution of the cloud 
and shared resources um, and all really the innovation that's going on in the cloud right now from a disaster recovery, from a failover perspective. This is not, having a hot site is not uh, only for the Fortune 500 anymore, right? This, this is technology that's uh, uh, followed Moore's law as far as, you know, the uh, cost of storage approaching zero, right? And storage has gotten really, really cheap. And uh, computing cycles with Amazon S3 and other cloud services, computing cycles that you can rent and lease are becoming cheaper and cheaper. You could see an environment where you have a server and the data from your primary server is being mirrored over the cloud to this real time to this other server, okay, for some of your systems, like your EHR system. And if you fail here, you literally flip a switch, point all your users and all your internal users and, and, and everybody else to this other server, um, you know, and if it works as advertised, you're down for maybe a half hour as that transition takes place. Martin, any questions here? Not at this time, sir. Okay, so you're going to have to select an alternate site, right? That's part, uh, that's core requirement of a disaster recovery plan. You're going to have to have some crisis communications management um, planning for your organization. It must be established so that critical members of your workforce will be contacted during a disaster, and you should have backups. Um, you should also establish several alternate communication strategies. Are you going to communicate by phone? Are you going to communicate over the internet? What are you going to do if this infrastructure totally fails? How are you going to how are you going to get the word out? Right? You have to have some sort of plan in place for how uh, whoever has taken charge on the ground to coordinate. Usually, it's going to be the security officer or some executive. How you're going to how you're going to communicate with required workforce members. Um, and you also have to communicate with and call into action essential third parties, right? So if Katrina is bearing down on you and you know you're going to have to do something, you better start making calls to your partners and saying, hey, we're just calling you. Is that server? Is that up and running? We still have availability. Is that all good? You know, uh, it, it really is when, you know, when, uh, when Katrina hits the fan, it really is about effective communication, right? And, and, and so it's an important thing. So one of the one of the things that you're gonna tabletop test is your communication strategy. <clears throat> and you're gonna want to have redundancy in essential staff. So you have to pull, you, you can't have Joe the DBA or Jane the DBA be the only person that knows anything about how to restore your Oracle or or or, or, or SQL Server database. Because what if Jane has been impacted by the disaster in a way that, you know, she's injured or she is flooded out. She can't get to a place or her internet connection is down, right? And so this is part of the tabletop test is what is the plan? What is the plan if a critical staff member does not, um, can't perform their functions, okay? And so you know, if, if you, you know, this is again, if you're going back to tabletop testing, which is what I recommend for small firms, you can imagine approaching this with a, a kind of like a scenario. We had this scenario, and then you know, the executive, you know, the, which is really, you know, a, a, at this point when it's when they are taking charge, more like a drill sergeant, making sure that people are doing what they're supposed to be doing, talking to each other the way they're supposed to be talking to each other, and notifications are going out to the entire organization. So. You should have a clear definition of a chain of command. Who reports to who? Who's calling the shots? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And you know we've talked about this from the very beginning. You're either going to have the tabletop test or live test your DRP. So basically, what's required here is you need to think hard about what you'll do if Katrina strikes. Okay. I got to tell you, there's no perfect DRP plans. Nobody's got them. Small firms don't have them. Small company entities don't have them. Big hospitals don't have them. It's a huge, wicked problem. It's a non-trivial problem, right? So perfection is not the requirement. Reasonable and appropriate is the requirement. Further, there is no requirement to recreate your entire physical infrastructure at the alternate site. However, at a minimum, you're going to want to quickly want to 
access to an alternative site with the ability to provide patients their PHI in a reasonably short period of time. Right? So if I'm a covered entity or I'm a business associate that's hosting PHI on behalf of a covered entity, that's what I'm focused on. How quickly can I get the systems that contain PHI up and running in an operational state so that we can continue our operations? Billing can wait, scheduling can wait, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, this is the third component uh, now. Emer Go ahead. Uh, we do have one question. It's two-parter. How, how effective would it be to use the cloud in a situation like Katrina, which might leave all local Internet providers out of service? That's part one. Would a contingency plan using paper documentation make more sense? Well, I mean, I think paper is going to be a fallback. I, I think paper is going to be somewhat of a fallback, but, you know, paper becomes less and, and less of a, a real alternative as uh, I, it, it, it's a quasi-real alternative now because the healthcare industry has been so dependent on paper that we're going to have paper around for the remainder of our lifetimes, right? So, you know, it's just not going to go away that fast. But, for example, to the degree that you start using less and less paper, then you, you know, it's going to be harder and harder to use paper as some sort of backup system that that will actually help you. Now, yes, you could create, you could have paper charts to treat new patients, but the paper is not going to help you uh, get access to that PHI that's been gone. So, the the um, here's here's the thing about Katrina, for example, if you had your information on a cloud and you were using software as a surface, yes, everything is down in. New Orleans, okay, everything is down in Plaquemines, Paris, everything, everything is down in St. Bernard, Paris, but a lot of people, not everybody, because we know what happened in the Superdome, but a lot of people were able to get to dry ground reasonably quick. They were able to get to Lafayette, they were able to get to other places, and if you had your information on the cloud, right, and if that cloud wasn't located in New Orleans, You'd be up and running. You just have to have another physical location, and you could get access to your data. If your patient calls, you could provide them their uh, their PHI. If, you know, once if, if some of your patients are then entering local hospitals, as local hospitals uh, become operational again, and you know, hospitals probably now are a lot better at having redundant power and checking all these things based on Katrina, then you're going to have access to the data because all you need to do is get physically out of New Orleans to get your staff access to the data. You don't have to go create, uh, recreate, uh, or even even uh, boot up your alternate site because there's some good chance that if you were, if you had your EHR on the cloud, that your cloud service never went down. It was just only the local ISPs that went down. Was that it, Martin? Yes. Okay. Okay, so emergency mode operations. An organization is required, again, when we say required, these are required implementation specifications of the security rule. Required to create an emergency mode operations plan. It implicates only those critical business processes, hardware, software, etc., that must be in place in order to protect the security and availability of EPHI. So, you know, a fire or Power, power outages. I mean, what, 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 are, what are those critical things that you got to get up and running so that you can have access to and provide availability to EPA? So I really, that, 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 is, that, that really drives, that analysis really drives the focus of what are we going to be focused on when this disaster happens? And I got to tell you, just going through that priority is, is going to be helpful to just thinking hard about what you're going to do. Do we need billing up and running? You know, probably not. Do we need scheduling up and running? Well, yeah, but probably not right away. If you just prioritize those systems that you got to have in place and focus on those systems that are absolutely necessary uh, to um, access, maintain, etc., your EPHI. So an emergency mode is just more limited in scope than disaster recovery. Okay. So for example, a hardware malfunction may have a critical information system down for a couple of days because of the immediate unavailability of replacement parts. But it may not be enough to trigger DRP. Depends. Depends on what's down. 
You know, if billing is down, eh, maybe not. If your scheduling, you know, your practice management scheduling system is down, maybe you can do it on paper until it comes back up. But on the other hand, a continued loss of electrical power at the principal site for a number of days for your EHR system, right, the fact, despite the fact that the geographic location of the principal site has not incurred a disaster, may indeed trigger the DRP. So for whatever reason, you lost power at, in, on your building. And either you didn't have or your backup redundant power failed. Well, now you got now you got a problem because now you're looking at your all your systems being down, including your critical systems, for two, three, four days. Who knows? Who knows how long you know that uh, it will take for the power to be restored. So, in short, emergency mode operations represent a subset of the DRP and exist along a continuum of contingencies that need to be addressed. And this is where we get back to what we introduced, and, and and I know this is this causes angst because it's uncertain, you know. And that, that, that's why it's a wicked problem. There are no bright line rules that define any of this, where one starts and the other stops. Uh, you have this continuum that you have to deal with. So your your EMOP should consider contingency organization needs to have in place in order to respond to reasonably anticipated emergencies. And I, I would really stress this, like anything else, especially this stuff, is you just got to get started on doing something. Thinking hard about it is the first hard, really hard step. Let's, get, let, let's give this the importance that it's due uh, and not be caught completely off guard when the inevitable, I, I can guarantee you this, a disaster may not be inevitable at your site, an emergency will be inevitable. There will be some sort of emergency because hardware fails, the grid fails, you know, people fail, et cetera, et cetera. But don't get hung up on academic, academic distinctions between a DRP and an EMOP. I mean, that's just that's the morass of stuff that's in the regulations. We just have to deal with it as best we can along this continuum. So here's my recommendation for it what I think is a straightforward EMOP for a small to medium sized practice. Identify emergency mode responsible responses for critical applications. For example, a redundant internet connection. Right? I, I mean, that's almost like a must have today. I, I, I wish uh, I had a redundancy in my internet connection, but I actually I don't. So my redundancy is if power went out in my building, I'm going to go to the library or I'm going to go to FedEx or I'm going to find a redundant place nearby and the best I have right now is I know where those are okay uh, but it would be better if I could just have a card or something and, and I could have my own redundant internet connection but a lawyer's files a law firm's files aren't as critical as PHI right so uh, there's the difference you want to incorporate your emergency mode strategies and responses into your DRP since there are a subset of it, that's, I mean, that's just where they fit. They're a subset of your DRP. Focus your e EMOP on single points of failure. All right? And this is where you get to, for example, redundant arrays, uh, RAID 5, mirroring. Uh, and I can tell you how that might work even for a small practice. And the technology has gotten so sophisticated that small practices can get this stuff implemented almost out of the box from like companies like CDW. You can get a network access device now that can implement RAID 5, that can implement mirroring, that has multiple hard disks in there. And I'll just give you, an, uh, RAID 5 is too technical to cover here, but I'll give you an example of what we've done is we have a network access device. It can hold up to five hard drives. It's got two drives in it. And I don't know how many gigabytes or terabytes those are, but they're big, they're large. And they're mirroring each other. So if one of those hard drive fails, the other one kicks in. And we have a program that's taking the primary data off of that network storage device and mirroring it to another server every couple of hours. So even if that network access device lost both hard drives, it would have to lose two hard drives before uh, there would be a loss of data. At least we could go back to what we had done two hours ago because we're also mirroring that. And then we're taking daily incremental backups to monthly 
uh, full backups. Okay, so that this don't don't get in the mode where you just throw up your hands. It is hard if you haven't done this before, and it's not fun. But the technology is available to implement something fairly reasonable now, even for a small business. Your EMOP should identify the point in the contingency continuum where sufficient local failures or an extended duration actually trigger your DRP. Right? Define define that. Hey, if our EHR system is down for two more to, for two for two days, that's too much. We're going to trigger our DRP and we're going to we're going to go to the alternate site. Your organization should test your EMOP as part of your DRP testing. Again, um, here for, for smaller firms, we're talking about tabletop testing. So this is the fourth component. Any questions? Not yet. Okay, so the organization is to address periodic testing and revision of contingency plans. Data backup plan, data recovery plan, disaster recovery plan, emergency mode operations plan. Under the security rule, this requirement is addressable. I'm going to just say this reinforce it. You either have to do it, do an alternative, or provide a compelling reason why your organization chose to do nothing. Good luck if you choose the latter. Now, end-to-end -end real time testing of a DRP, for example, can be an extremely expensive proposition in terms of staff time, consulting time, etc. This is really, really a painful thing to say, you know what, on this weekend we're gonna gather we're gonna gather all the staff, we're gonna flip the stroll switch, we're gonna bring the systems down, we're gonna real time test. Uh, obviously it doesn't get any better than that. And most of the times those don't work out that well and you just have to fix your plan. Okay, and then hopefully you do it again until you get better results, but it's probably not going to happen for most small to mid-sized covered entities and business associates. So you're, you're going to have to uh, choose an appropriate alternative based on the flexibility, principle, size of your organization, resources, et cetera, et cetera. And this is one place where I think you can readily justify invoking the flexibility principle and that you chose tabletop rigorously tabletop test. Now we, we I think we've already spent a fair amount of time between what, what might be might might uh, what actually probably wouldn't be considered a rigorous rigorous tabletop test, just faking it to a pretty you know uh, um, solid effort at really exercising your plan, uh, even if it's just on the tabletop. So here's a reasonable alternative to end-to-end -end real time DRP testing. It's establish a test team. Obviously, if you don't have a test team, you know, you're not you're not uh, you haven't even reached first base. An executive as ex designated leader is going to be executive or the security officer or somebody who's going to take charge and run the show when the disaster really happens. That's the person that'll be running the show on the tabletop test. Ensure that each team member understands his or her role and trains a designated backup so that you don't have Jane or John, the DPA, being the only person to know how to restore media to the database, for example, or how to get the network backup, uh, et cetera. Identify, and it's really important, it's identif identification of all applications really is step one in a risk assessment anyway. So you really have to do this. Okay? Identify all applications and infrastructure that are critical to your organization's operations. Obviously, you want to contain EPHI. You should have done this as part of your risk assessment. It's really, really critical to have this inventory because so many other things in the security rule are based on it. And then perform end-to-end -end testing of your data backup plan, including a full restore from a local backup. Perform a mock-up, mock DB. Uh, database, uh, database backup plan testing from off-site backups. Okay, these are the things that are reasonable to do. Uh, they're not live. You're not testing your type of disaster recovery plan, but you're testing a part of it, right? You're at least testing this part. Perform mock testing of your organization's entire DRP, including primary and alternative communication systems. Are you going to communicate through Twitter or you know uh, Yelp or whatever? Perform mock testing of your EMOPs and a prioritized criticality list that 
obviously means they prioritize application criticality, which are the EPA, EPHI systems that are most critical. And then document your results and modify your plans accordingly. I mean, if I'm an auditor and, and a particular small covered entity has had a breach, and that's why I'm there, uh, and they say that they have a, a, a the tabletop tested um, their disaster recovery plan, I'm going to want to see the results. So you ask what is the visible demonstrable evidence other than just an agenda and showing who attended the meeting. No, I want to see the results of your tabletop testing. If you can't show me results, then I'm going to assume that you didn't really do it. And what modifications did you make to your plan based on the results from your tabletop test? That's the level of rigor that you need to reach if you actually want to make a good faith argument that you exercised your tabletop uh, testing in a way that, that meets the rule. Okay, the final component, applications and data criticality analysis. We've already talked about applications inventory. This is what this is referring to. Uh, and I really believe this is a misnomer because you've got to do this as first step in the risk assessment anyway, but there you have it. It says, your organization is to address the relative criticality of specific applications and data in support of other contingency plan components. Although this is not a required, this is commentary now, although this is not a required implementation specification, there really appears to be no reasonable alternative or substitute for it, especially given its usefulness in other business continuity components. So, in other words, what I'm trying to share with you is here, I, I don't see how you choose to do nothing here. You just, there's no substitute you can, that you can do in place. You just have to have that inventory. And as we've discussed, this is, in fact, the first step required as part of a risk assessment. So you absolutely have to have this inventory, and you should have some criticality assigned to your applications. So the conclusion. Like so many things related to compliance, the business continuity requirements of the security rule appear and are overwhelming at first. However, once you break down BC into its component parts, it should be quite manageable, even for small to medium-sized CEs and BAs. You can use this webinar as a launch point. Use these uh, relatively straightforward, simple plans as a way to get started. Um, Here's the best advice I can give you. Get something in place ASAP and then continue to refine it over time. That goes for anything you're doing with respect to HIPAA high tech compliance. Uh, and here's our quick shameless plug. I most of you know that we, we have the HIPAA Survival Guide sells uh, a subscription with all our products and we have uh, individual products as well. You can go to the store.hipasurvivalguide.com to read more about it. We try to provide you the recipe, the how to, and not just the ingredients. We try to provide you, and believe we do provide you educational products that you can start executing on on day one. It's meant to be agile and iterative. It's agnostic for the most part, That's whether you're a BA or CE. It's wetware as opposed to software. It's what you need to know to do your compliance. You can click on any one of these and actually take a look inside some of our major products in your PDF. It will take you to a place where you can kind of flip through uh, these books and look, look at what you actually get when you purchase the subscription or what you actually get when you purchase an individual product. So at this point, I'm going to throw it open again to questions. We have no questions at this time. Oh, come on. It's 3 o'clock. There's got to be some questions out there. Well, I know when... Uh we had uh, four hurricanes in six weeks uh, down here some years back. Uh, my my big plan, which wasn't really good, was to take the computer home. So I don't I, think I, I think taking the computer home was a lot of people's uh, plan. You know, they're going to get they're going to get in the car and take the server and drive somewhere and. You know, I mean, uh, that sounds like a reasonable plan until you, until you figure out what happened to Charlie, where Charlie went inland and everybody that was trying to get away from Charlie got hit by Charlie. And what if you have a disaster and, right, you get run over and then your server is gone and the, the business just, you know. Ever since Katrina, i got to tell you that, ever since Katrina, people are spending um, a lot more time thinking about this sort of thing. And because... 
Katrina made the general awareness of the business community of these issues go up, um, the standard is much higher now. So when we talk about Katrina proof, if you don't do these basic things, then it's it's going to be almost impossible to make a a, a good faith argument that you did, you did what you should have done under the security rule. Okay, well, so if there, I was going to ask you a question. Um, obviously, we all know what Katrina is. Now, do you think, honestly, there were that many uh, upgrades and contingency plans made by businesses uh, along the Northeast for when Sandy blew in there? No, <laughs> I don't. There, I, there was, I don't. So that wasn't that wasn't the point that I was making. My my point is that because of Katrina, what you should do there's a general there's a more general awareness of what you should do, what you should have done, right? And in the case of a covered entity, it's in the security rule. So that's part of your compliance, right? In the case of the law firms, we don't have any of that kind of stuff that drives what we're supposed to do with our client file. We do have, you know, a standard to protect our client's data, but it's not in any specific regulation. It's just not that rigorous, right? And so what my, my point is, is that if the disaster happens to you and you didn't do what you should have done, everybody's going to know it. A few, very few people are going to uh, be people. Auditors, judges, opposing counsel, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are going to be very sympathetic to the fact that Eight, you know, uh, eight years after Katrina, the Northeast didn't do what they should have done for Sandy. So no, I don't believe that because, it, like I like I said, this is painful. It's not fun. It's not things that people tend to focus on. Nobody gets any uh, ticking marks for doing a good job on DRP. It's just one of those things that has to be done. Um, we have a question. Does your HIPAA survival guide provide any humorous security training templates that would help it be more reliable to the general user or employee base. I don't think humorous was the word they wanted in there. But. Humorous? Yeah. I, 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 no, I don't think there's anything humorous about our, our, our templates, especially in this regard. We do walk through. We do walk through the requirements, and we do give you suggestions as to what you should be doing for each one of these requirements, and. We've now supplemented this with this webinar, and all our uh, live webinars get stored and are available to our subscribers as sort of additional uh, training, answer additional questions. Uh, that There's just a library of them that you can listen to them uh, at your leisure. But for example, the, if I can back up one slide, if you go look inside the security rule checklist, you're going to see... Uh, the policy definition for the, the business continuity uh, standard, the uh, suggested processes that you should implement, and ways that you should track process results—they're part of they're part of the security rule checklist. So the checklist is not a um, you know a, a simple-minded one, two, three. It's it's a pretty rigorous uh, capture of what this requirement is, what your policy ought to be. What are the underlying processes that you should implement, and how should you track process results? In other words, each checklist item is giving you the roadmap for uh, having the ability to demonstrate visible, demonstrable evidence that you met this particular requirement. And it goes through every requirement of the security rule. It goes through every requirement of the privacy rule, and the breach notification framework is a little bit different animal because the if you look at HHS's audit protocols that they released a while back, all they did was go through, uh, all they did was put in a spreadsheet all the requirements, you know, so there's no, so the, there's no guessing as to what you should do to comply with HIPAA. There really should be no guessing. There are certain requirements in the HIPAA rules, and that's what you got to comply with. And if the requirements aren't in the HIPAA rules, then you can safely assume you don't have to require. You don't have to be guessing. It's not this mystical exercise. Before the High Tech Act, there were this 42 questions that you might get asked in a HIPAA audit. Well, I can guarantee you what you're going to be asked. You're going to be asked, how did you implement, how did you comply with the requirements of the security rule? How did you comply with the requirements of uh, uh, the privacy rule? Are you prepared for a breach if it happens? Are you tracking security incidents? If you're not tracking security incidents, 
then you can't report on them, right? Because you're not tracking them. Your people don't even know who to call. Do you have sample letters that you are that you have available to send out? Uh, you know, and if you're not encrypting, it's not if a breach happens, it's when a breach happens, right? And so that's what our products try to do is try to give you the how the how to uh, because the HIPAA, the HIPAA regulations, uh, the HIPAA statute and regulations are not prescriptive; they're descriptive. They just tell you what the requirement is. They don't tell you how to go about actually uh, meeting that requirement. We have two other um, uh, questions here. Um, as a follow-up to the humorous, it's an enigmatic. Enig it's a big, it's a puzzle wrapped in an enigma, but what the person meant was light-hearted or something less dry than the actual material is. I don't think that's possible because it is actually dry. There's nothing you can do about that. But the second yeah, part... Not, I, I, I have a pretty good sense of humor, but I, there's just not too much I can do with that material. Yeah. <laughs> what I mean, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty dry. You know? yeah. Don Rickles would be hard-pressed to do anything with it. And the second question we have is, is your survival guide geared more towards small practices or does it apply to a 250-bed hospital? No, it applies to everybody. It's just that we, we purposely, uh, you know, um, here, here's the thing. Maybe some of you have heard this, you know. Freud said he had two patients would come in with the same kind of headache, except one had a $50 headache and the other person had a $50,000 headache. Right? And the only difference was is that the person with the $50,000 headache had a lot more money. And so the moral of the story is they didn't think, you know, we created a $75, $795 a year subscription to, to price so that the masses of small covered entities and uh, business associates could find it affordable. And we, that was a strategic marketing, but it's equally applicable, and I would uh, tell you that it's probably uh, uh, better and more effective than uh, a lot of other much more expensive uh, competition. Well, I would have to say that you're probably biased as well as I am in that respect. Well, so just we, a little. <laughs> yeah. Just, but just we, little. we do have uh, a state that has uh, chosen to use the HIPAA survival guide. So that's one down, 49 to go? Well, we have various counties, and we have yeah. some hospitals, and we have some lawyers, and, you know, we have uh, subscribers that are from all over the map. So people are, it's not just uh, the, the, our, our, our target that has sort of bought into it. we we got subscribers that uh, are across the continuum. I think that's that's all we have uh, on here now. All right, I would encourage you if you uh, get are getting value out of these webinars to subscribe to our uh, monthly newsletter. That's where you get notified of what we have. We've been having uh, one every month, and we plan to continue having one a month. It's usually the third Thursday of the month at uh, two o'clock, and so look to the newsletter uh, to stay updated. Um, thanks for attending. It's been my pleasure being with you again today.